Apologies for our late delay tonight. Um, Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Welcome to you all. My name is Jill Mills, and tonight we will be talking about the benefits of exercise in the context of cancer. Hand over to Prue now. Thank you, Prue. Thank you so much. So my name is Prue Cormie. I'm an exercise physiologist. I work. Uh, down in Melbourne, actually, at Australian Catholic University, and it's it's really wonderful to be here today with uh, Cancer Council New South Wales and and the ladies here to to hear your story, Sherry. It was fabulous and and great to hear about the research going on, Jeanette. So, um, it's it's really wonderful to be here. And what I wanted to do uh, with the the time that I have is really talk a little bit more about the practicalities of exercise and how you guys can actually realise the benefits that Jeanette has been talking about and that Sherry has, has experienced. Um, so feel free to ask any questions you like and there's also my contact details up there. You can always reach out and, and chat to us if you have more questions offline. So I think just to summarise what Jeanette said, you know, what is, why should you exercise? And if we put everything together about what we know from the scientific literature, we can confidently say that based on everything that the science tells us, exercise offers the greatest potential as an additional therapy or medicine to reverse treatment related side effects, to help increase your well-being quality of life and could potentially even extend survival uh, following a cancer diagnosis. Um, Jeanette touched on some of the, the side effects that exercise has established efficacy in counteracting things like physical deconditioning, fatigue, psychological distress, unfavourable changes to body composition. We know that exercise can help to counteract these things. Exercise can help improve your physical well-being, can help improve your mental well-being and can also interact with your social well-being. Um, and there's some really um, good evidence and it's, it's only suggestive at this stage, but some growing body of evidence to suggest that exercise is associated with low relative risk of uh, cancer specific death, of cancer recurrence or cancer coming back, and also of dying from any cause. So when we put all this together, we really see that exercise is, is a medicine. And if the effects of exercise could be encapsulated in a pill, it would undoubtedly be the most widely prescribed medication in the world. And even if this pill had just a fraction of the positive health benefits that regular exercise provides, um, it, it would be given to every single patient mm. with, with cancer. Um, now the reason that exercise can do this, it's, it's one intervention that has a lot of benefits. And the reason that exercise can do this is because it's a really potent way to positively influence all the body systems at the same time. So exercise impacts the, positively impacts the structure and the function of virtually all the body systems. So it helps the heart and the blood vessels function effectively. It helps your lungs transport oxygen to all your muscles. It helps build your muscles and strengthen your bones. It helps regulate your metabolism and your hormones, which really communicate to a lot of the functions that happen within your body. Um, it, it helps your brain communicate to your body and understand how and when you should move. And it also helps enhance your immune system, allows your body to, to fight off infection and, and indeed diseases such as cancer and, and other chronic conditions. Um, so exercise is a very effective medicine. Um, now when we actually think about putting exercise medicine into practice, what, what does this look like? What does an exercise prescription mean? Jeanette touched on the evidence-based guidelines and this is what we know from an extensive body of scientific literature that to realise the therapeutic effects of exercise, so to get significant health benefits, we need to be achieving 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise each week and in addition to this, two to three resistance exercise sessions that are performed at a moderate intensity. Now, basically what this means, there's some funny numbers there, but 150 minutes equates to a 30-minute brisk walk on five days a week. And two to three resistance exercise sessions really means um, doing weight-bearing activities, lifting weights, using the large muscle groups, going across multiple joints in your body, usually um, two to three gym sessions that are about 30 to 45 minutes each week. 
Now, a key element to actually achieving these health benefits is the intensity of the exercise or the quality of the exercise that you're actually doing. Um, so you'll notice here it's a moderate intensity. And, and what does that mean? So it means that when you're doing these exercises that you can't just go shopping, window shopping. You actually have to be walking at a brisk pace. As, as Jeanette said, walking as if you're late for a meeting. Um, or this could be riding a bike or swimming or, or jogging, um, you know, whatever it may be. The key thing is you want to feel that your heart beat is increased, your breathing rate, you're puffing, um, you're, you're increasing your, your body temperature so you're sweating a little bit. And if I asked you how hard you were working, you would perceive the difficulty of that exercise as being between somewhat hard to hard. Um, now it's really important that we focus on the intensity because what we see from the science is that the better quality exercise that you do, so the higher the intensity of the exercise that you do, the more benefits you gain. Um, so it's really important that it's, it's thinking about not just doing exercise but doing exercise well. Now a key component to this, for a lot of people you probably look at this and you think, how on earth could I possibly achieve this? It's so much exercise. Um, but what we do in terms of delivering this is we gradually build up, as Jeanette said. This is individually tailored, so it's specific to um, your health condition, your current status, what treatments you've been going through, what kind of symptoms you're experiencing, and then it's progressed steadily, so we increase this and increase this and work towards the, the ultimate ga um, goal of achieving this, these guidelines. Now what we do, and, and we're moving beyond these guidelines to really push forward in terms of enhancing the, the potential of exercise to help manage the side effects that you, you experience going through cancer and cancer treatments by incorporating targeted exercises that are specific to the type of cancer you have, the stage of cancer that you're, you're um, diagnosed with, what kind of treatments you've gone through, what your current health status is and, and what kind of side effects you're experiencing. So I'm sorry the video can't play here, but what, what this is is an example of how we use exercise in, in a different way. So we get gentlemen with prostate cancer who are undergoing hormone therapy or androgen deprivation therapy. We actually get them to jump over little hurdles, we get them to skip, we get them to hop and leap. And the reason that we do this is that the treatment of, of the hormone therapy involved with prostate cancer really accelerates the loss of bone mineral density or the, the quality of the bone that these guys experience. So we're doing a very sophisticated type of exercise prescription based on trying to counteract that very specific side effect. And we can do this with all sorts of different kinds of cancers and different kinds of side effects. Um, but it, it very much is about trying to tailor the exercise prescription so it's specific to you and the, 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 the treatments that you're going through. Now the key message here is, you know, is as much as possible and, and even if you can't work to achieving these, these ideal levels, just keep in mind that avoiding inactivity, uh, even when you're undergoing very difficult treatments and even when you're experiencing really difficult side effects and extensive fatigue, as much as you possibly can to try and avoid inactivity. And to keep in mind that generally speaking, some exercise is better than none and generally more exercise is better than less. Um, and if I can just add to that, the quality of the exercise is really important. So higher quality exercise gives you the best benefits. So higher intensity, better benefits. And this is generally speaking as well. So how do you, how do you actually try and achieve this? What, what can you do to, to get into this kind of high quality exercise? Well, you need to see a health specialist. You need to see the, the most appropriate health professional to try and provide the advice and, and prescription that you need specific to your cancer. And that health professional is an accredited exercise physiologist. Um, so accredited exercise physiologists are, are university qualified allied health professionals recognised through Medicare and a number of other organisations as the most appropriate uh, health professional to work with chronic conditions and to, to deliver exercise over a long period of time. So as an exercise physiologist I use exercise as a medicine to help manage disease and improve well-being. And to realise the significant health benefits of exercise, we use very targeted exercise prescriptions based on a change that we want to achieve within our body. So 
by understanding what happens inside our bodies when we exercise, an exercise physiologist can prescribe exercise in much the same way that any doctor prescribes a medication. So we use specific types of exercises at precise intensities and volumes based on a certain physiological change or a mechanism of action and a dosage and amount of that, that exercise required to make some sort of physiological change, whether it's, as you saw with the men with prostate cancer, trying to slow the loss of bone. Now, accredited exercise physiologists, there's over 4,000 you know, practicing in Australia, most of, most of which are, are based in the community. And, and you can find an exercise physiologist by going online to the website here, www.essa.org.au. You can click onto the button that says find an EP near you, pop in your postcode and it'll come up with a range of different exercise physiologists that are close to you. Now, exercise physiologists are qualified. They, they go through university, they have extensive continuing professional education requirements, but if you really want to maximise the safety and the effectiveness of your exercise prescription, you want to be seeing someone who has specialised expertise in working with people with cancer. Um, now, in order to do that, where our team has been working on um, key educational programs, professional development courses that allows for exercise physiologists to learn about the latest scientific evidence and best practice, clinical practice in delivering exercise to people with cancer. So, um, I can give you a website later on in the webinar that shows, uh, that basically gives you a list of exercise physiologists based on states that have gone through and completed this additional education. So it's, it's key people that have um, provided a, 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 or have gone through education to really hone their skills and, and, and maximise the ability to work with you safely and to maximise the efficacy of that exercise prescription. So a big question here is, wait, hold on a second, if I'm going to see an exercise physiologist, won't that be really expensive, especially if it's someone with specialised expertise? Um, well, there is a cost with seeing an exercise physiologist, just like any other health professional. But exercise physiologists uh, do have subsidised services through Medicare. And you can access these subsidies through um, talking to your general practitioner about a chronic disease management plan. Uh, through the Chronic Disease Management Plan, you can be eligible to up to five visits with an accredited exercise physiologist, and they can be individual visits. And the out-of-pocket cost for something like that may be as low as around $10, or it might even be completely subsidised, depending on who you're seeing. Now, in addition to that, there's over 30 private health insurers that now provide subsidies for uh, exercise physiology services. Uh, and those subsidies are not only just about individual sessions, but also about group exercise sessions. And, and generally speaking, if you're being involved in a, a, in a program, in a group service, it costs around $10 to $20 per session. Now, this is a cost, and, and it is an additional cost. I would say that uh, you would pay more for a plumber to fix your toilet than it would be to go and see an exercise physiologist to fix your body. So thinking about that cost as an investment and an investment that brings about other benefits. So it improves not only the ability to counteract the side effects of the treatment and the cancer itself, but it also improves your overall well-being. It can help manage any kind of um, comorbid or chronic diseases or other health issues that you may be experiencing. And it may help kickstart um, some other health enhancing behaviours such as improving your diet, helping to lower your alcohol um, intake and also helping to quit smoking. So I think when you, when you think about the investment and the potential benefits that you get out of exercise, it really probably is the best insurance policy you can invest in. I think another thing that a lot of patients ask is, okay, well, if, if I go and see an exercise physiologist and I'm working towards these guidelines, will I actually be able to comply? Could I do that prescription? And what we see from working with thousands of cancer patients, both during treatment, recovering from treatment, and a long time after treatment is yes, absolutely. When the exercise is prescribed and monitored in, in an appropriate way for you, in an individualised way, the, the compliance rates in, in achieving those evidence-based guidelines are very high. So 80 to 90% of um, people, or 80 to 90% will attend the, those, um, will, will attain that 150 minutes and the, the two to three resistance exercise sessions and can maintain that over a, a period of time of, of six months with a very small discontinuation rate. Now, when you compare that to the ability to, to take 
drugs, medications for high blood pressure or depression, exercise really stacks up quite well. So um, even though it seems very scary in the first place, I would encourage you to, after you see an exercise physiologist, realize that you absolutely can comply with this prescription. And even though it seems a little bit scary initially, you can, you can work towards getting there. I think a key question now is, is how do you get started? And uh, my best advice would be to go and see an exercise physiologist. And if you don't know who to see, you know, reach out to the Cancer Council in New South Wales, talk to your GP, talk to your specialist, talk to your nurse, um, and, and ask them to refer you to an exercise physiologist who has an interest and expertise in working with cancer patients. Uh, cancer Council New South Wales has a, a really fantastic suite of resources, uh, amazing people working in this space that can really provide a lot of valuable information about how you can get started. And you know, aside from that, just remember to avoid an activity. Pop out and go for a walk. And if you can walk just to the letterbox today, try and walk <laughs> a little bit further the next day, around the block, around the, the, the day after that, and just try and continually progress a little bit further each time. So there's a whole bunch of information, there's videos, there's resources that you can access through our website here in addition to the Cancer Council's website. Um, I did a TED talk recently talking about the role of exercise for, for people with cancer and, and how exercise can, can generate these benefits um, and that's available on our website too. So I really encourage you to, to have a look at the, the website um, and you can start to follow us through social media as well and we can provide a lot more information through those formats. So thanks very much and I'm very happy to take any questions. There were quite a few questions rolling through, but as they were coming through, you were kind of answering them as well. Oh, great. Which was, which was fantastic. <laughs> it's like, you're obviously talking about what people want to hear about. Um, so I think most of them have been covered. There was one about hydrotherapy, a proper hydrotherapy mm. program. Is that counted as sort of resistance exercise? So not necessarily resistance exercise. Uh, hydrotherapy does involve more resistance, but the key thing about Hydrotherapy is um, it, it's a great modality to do aerobic exercise to get your heart rate and your lungs, um, your cardiovascular system really training well without having the impact and the loading of um, doing these exercises outside the pool. So it can be a fabulous way to get started, especially if you have issues with hips, knees, back and so on. Um, and, and there's some great programs out there and, and great specialists who work with um, working with the, the therapy. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a great modality to do for, more so for aerobic exercise rather than resistance exercise. Mm -hmm. When we talk about resistance exercise, it's really lifting weights. So it's working against a resistance that's going to load your muscles and your bones such that they're working hard. So, you know, it's not Arnold Schwarzenegger style kind of lifting ridiculously heavy weights, but it's lifting weights that will, will generate um, a response within your muscle. So typically you have to be doing that in a weight-bearing environment, which is not in the pool necessarily and not on a bike, for example. It's, it's usually walking, running, or in the gym lifting weights. Um, and you covered about people being scared and how much should I do. I think, you know, they're worrying about if I'm not feeling well or I'm feeling fatigued, should I be exercising, should I be resting? If I've got, we talked about today having, you know, a pain. And, Completely. Yeah. It's, it's a really good question and it's very difficult. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, you know, we think, oh, I'm tired, I'm fatigued or I've got pain, I need to rest, I need to conserve my energy or I need to let my, the joint heal or whatever the soreness is. What we know from really high quality research evidence, the, the science is telling us that's, that's probably the worst thing you can do. Mm. Uh, if you are, even if you're feeling really fatigued or you have pain, if you exercise in a well-managed way, so an appropriately prescribed exercise program will help you counteract that fatigue, will energize you, um, and will help actually manage that pain, reduce the severity of the pain. And even though it seems like a funny thing to say, this is what we know from an extensive amount of research. Um, so on those days when you're feeling fatigued I, and you, the last thing you want to do is get out of bed, I really try, encourage you just to try and get up and, and, and be as active as you can uh, and, and rest when you need to and, and in, you know, have mm. the, the intervals in between how much activity mm. you do and how much rest you do. And all reinforce that as well. Sharing. Yeah, no, I was I'm just going to comment on that. Um, I think it helps with fatigue a lot and sometimes, I mean, I'm pretty much active all day but by about five o'clock I get a 
bit tired sometimes, but since exercising more, it's gotten less. Mm -hmm. So it, it does really help. Yeah. We, we recently did a webinar about fatigue and again, one of the things was pacing yourself. Absolutely. So it's another one you can go online and have a look at if, if you're interested. Uh, and neuropathy, when all the questions were coming with the registrations, there were a few questions about neuropathy and exercise. Yes. Again, we have done a webinar about that as well. But um, if you'd like to comment about well, the best exercise evidence, and neuropathy. The best evidence of what can help neuropathy, um, particularly, say, people that have had it after oxaliplatin for colorectal, is probably exercise mm -hmm. as well. So it may restrict slightly what exercises that you can do, um, particularly if you can't feel where your feet are in, mm -hmm. in yeah. space. Um, but maybe, for example, on an exercise bike, uh, so that that's less of an issue um, would be a really good form for people with where particularly they have the foot neuropathy. Absolutely. So the best advice there is to, to see an exercise physiologist because what they can do is really help manage um, the specifics of your neuropathies. If you can't grip a weight or hold mm. on to something or you're having issues with balance or, like you said, there's sensation in your feet, there's ways we can get around that and work around that while still being able to exercise in a way that we know will will help. So there's, there's early evidence to suggest that exercise may help manage neuropathies. Um, and certainly from just an anecdotal point of view, we've, we've seen it in our clinics uh, quite extensively um, that, that people can um, manage neuropathies and do exercise in a way that they can still realise significant health benefits. And I'll reinforce that as well because I had problems with my hands and feet and still do, not severe but it's getting better. But I found that when I do weights at night, by the time I've finished it's heaps mm. better. Mm. And also knitting. I know it's not exercise, but it, yeah, <laughs> it keeps, keeps yeah. your hands going. And my feet too. I do balancing exercises at home and it has really helped. Yeah. Good. And there was a question here about yoga. Yoga, body weight and core. Again, you know, it's so, not a type of yoga, I guess. Absolutely. So abs absolutely really encourage you to, if, if yoga is what you love doing and it gets you off the couch and exercising, absolutely do it. Um, and there's some great benefits from yoga. What, it's not included in the evidence-based guidelines because there's very little research done on yoga um, and, and that's why we don't yet know uh, exactly what the benefits may be and whether or not they should be included in evidence-based guidelines. But I will say anything, any form of activity that, that keeps you moving mm. is, is a fabulous thing to do. And, and just remember when you want to realise significant health benefits, you really have to be focusing on the quality of that exercise. Mm and see an EP that's qualified to help you. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the, most definitely. It's the, and it's, you know, it could just be one conversation. It's just seeing a, seeing a specialist and, and one conversation and they can work with you to, to, be, to be able to formulate a program that's specific to you. Yeah. So we might start on the questions. And again, some of them we've, I guess we've kind of covered that, um, so how much is enough exercise or not enough? So that's a the level and again it's individualised I, I guess isn't it? Well I guess, sorry, Go ahead. Uh, by the guidelines I, I would try and aim for that as a minimum and to go further. Now there will be some people that can't do that so I think it's back to what both of us have said, mm. if a little bit is better than nothing and um, more is better still. We don't yet know what the ideal amount mm. is. Mm. Yeah. Ab absolutely. And, uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, those guidelines, uh, they're, they're lofty numbers as well. You know, when you're going through chemotherapy or really tough treatments, there's, sometimes there's no way in the world you can, you can get out for that volume of exercise. So I think another thing, and just practically speaking, you know, don't, don't try and put yourself in a hole to always do this. Listen to your body, you know, listen, allow your body to respond. As long as you're doing something and each time that you go out, you're trying to progress that, that little bit more. Um, I think that's, you know, working towards those evidence-based guidelines is always the, the key thing and that's how you're going to get significant health benefits. But keeping in mind that, that something is better than nothing. Yeah. So I guess keeping a track of what you're doing, like writing it down so you can, you know, have a... a a journal, I guess. Some people find around. that really helpful or yeah. um, some of the devices some and things. Yeah. 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 Um, 
There's an interesting one, Meredith L. She's got a 19-year-old daughter that's had brain cancer. And again, it's she wants some help. Like, how can she motivate her 19-year-old daughter mm. who used to be a you know cross-country runner and all this sort of thing? And to and it's harder, I think, when when people are younger. Mm. Um, any suggestions for her? Yeah, uh, the best advice really then is to see an exercise physiologist yeah. because mm. what I mean it's really individual. So what we know some key things about what can help motivate people to exercise. Certainly understanding why exercise is important and what benefits Meredith will, Meredith's daughter will receive mm. is going to be important. But if you see a, a, an exercise physiologist, a specialist who's really working in this area, they'll be able to individualize that advice and mm. work through the specific barriers that. Meredith's daughter is, ex is experiencing. So uh, that's probably the best way to do that. And probably to try and um, enlist the support of other younger mm -hmm. friends, yeah. for example, so that, um, and they may need to modify what they're doing. But mm. um, again, so it's individualising mm. for what she's interested in, um, which won't necessarily be what mum's interested in. Mm, or, exactly. um, but then enlisting it so that it, um, that can really help and we've found with our challenge study where we've looked at some interim analyses for that, that we think the behavioural support sessions mm -hmm. are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So it's not just enough to say, go and exercise, but you need to help, you need help to incorporate that into your everyday life. Mm -hmm. And um, that's probably just as important, if not more important for a, a young mm -hmm. um, adult or teenager. And I think the next question um, is a tough one. Again, daily lifestyle, so we have a good segue there from you. Thank you. Um, mental health, addictions, domestic issues. So I guess for this person it's a bit of a struggle. Like, um, So, you know, well, I'm not quite sure what to suggest here. Yeah, so we know that exercise, so exercise has established management therapy for the treatment of clinical depression. So exercise can help uh, manage clinical depression and is um, really the first line treatment and that's provided to um, from Australian guidelines, from international guidelines. So exercise can actually help with the management of mental health conditions. But you know, it comes back to these behavioural elements in terms of yeah. how do you incorporate, mm. incorporate that into your everyday daily lifestyle. So when we talk about behavioural interventions, what does this mean? It means some basic things, setting goals, breaking those goals down into small steps that are achievable, that are specific, planning well. So, you know, what what specifically are you going to do? When are you going to mm. do it? How are you going to do it? What happens if it's cold? What happens if it's wet? Mm. Who are you going to do it with? What equipment do you need? All those kind of specifics. And then working through some key barriers. So finding time is always the hardest thing and, and sometimes there's expense involved. So it's just breaking down all those components really to make sure that it can fit within your daily lifestyle, especially when, you know, when you're trying to juggle a lot of, a lot of mm. things. And so would you, when you were talking before, so about going to the GP, maybe that could be a, a port of call to start with to, Absolutely. to get a chronic management plan to maybe go and see Completely. An exercise physiologist mm. or someone else that's appropriate mm. to help at this stage, I guess. Absolutely. Mm. And, and just remember, it's, it's, it's a, just a conversation initially. Mm. You don't have to commit to anything. You know, going to your GP and, and asking to, to have a referral to an exercise physiologist allows you then to go and have a conversation with someone who is a, a qualified professional in helping you counteract these barriers mm -hmm. and, and incorporate exercise into your daily lifestyle so they can individualise that care and that advice so it's specific to you and, and your circumstance. And, you know, it's an hour out of your day that then you can and you can decide what you do from there, really. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking with the, as you had up on the screen, that 10 to $12 is what you pay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that could be a few cups of coffee. Yeah. 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 Let's face it. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. I guess you have to get your priorities mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. on that one there. Um, so exercise that should be avoided or put to the bottom of the list? Are there any things that people should be wary of? You know, maybe you're not going to go to an exercise physiologist, you're just maybe going to go to your local gym or try and do things yourself. So what are the things to maybe look out for that could be you know, not beneficial in some instances? I think the important thing is just to start gradually. Mm. So particularly if you've got fatigue still from your cancer or you have more advanced disease, 
if you just, you know, really get stuck into it too hard to begin with. Yeah. For your two steps forward, you may end up taking three or four steps back. Yeah. So it's a matter of starting gradually. Um, for people that um, are less mobile or haven't done exercise before, I usually suggest that they start with walking and build up mm. from that. So I think it's more about so gradual, gradual build up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So there are what we call, I suppose, in the industry is, is contraindications. So there's health conditions and situations which would mean that you, we wouldn't exercise with you and we do maybe some checks on your health first before we do exercise. So again, that it's it's hard to answer this without the specifics of the individual, but mm -hmm. I would see an exercise physiologist for for that. Um, if you have if you have complex health history, if you have chronic diseases such as diabetes or cardiovascular disease that you're managing well or you're not particularly managing well, I think in having a conversation with your GP, having a conversation with the exercise physiologist is the the best approach to do there. And there are some key things. For example, you know, um, if somebody has, um, if you have urinary incontinence, if you leak um, secondary to any kind of radiotherapy to the pelvis or, or surgery, for example, prostate cancer surgery, we wouldn't be doing any jumping or running or things like that. So um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's probably something that's pretty mm. uncomfortable. Um, people whose cancers spread to their bones, their bones are more fragile, so we're very careful and cautious around the exercise that we do there. So, yeah, there, there, there definitely are some situations that we need to be a bit careful with the exercise. Um, but as Jeanette said, if, if people are generally well, walking you can do straight away and you can just gradually progress and just listen to your body and how mm. you respond. Mm. If any concerns whatsoever, go and see your GP. Mm. Yeah. And I guess on the flip side, the best types and amounts, which I think we probably talked about that enough, I think. Yeah. Um, so I will yeah. say, even though we're talking about the evidence-based guidelines, the best type of exercise is anything that's going to get you exercising. Mm. Whatever it is that gets you off the couch, mm. do that. You know, and yeah. and um, and then try to be dancing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There's so yeah. Many. And just remember that it's avoiding inactivity. Anything that can keep you active is going to be beneficial for you. Yeah. And your mental health as well. Yeah. Yeah. We've covered incidental exercise. It doesn't count. Well, some of those would, like gardening <laughs> and, and things. Would they? Like, okay. Like, again, it's being active. Yeah. yeah. But it's not what we want is stuff that will get the heart rate up. Yeah. It's I guess it depends on what type of gardening. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I think we've sort of covered most of questions. I hope we've covered everyone's questions that have come up. Um, I need the mouse because we need oh, to sorry. the sorry. That's all right. So thanks, everybody. I know we started a little late. I'm not sure exactly what time, but it was probably about 10 past, I think. So our hour is nearly up. So um, again, we talked about Cancer Council 13, 11, 20. So if you've got any questions, feel free to call tomorrow and, and ask us any advice that you might need. We also have a new online um, forum, Cancer Council Online Community, which is a place you can go to and just chat and meet up with other people. Um, and again, Lifeline 13, 11, 14, if you, anything's come up and you want, would like to speak to anybody um, about it. So thank you to the panel for coming along tonight. It's been great and very interesting and looking at the chat box, um, everybody's like, this is great information. I've never heard a lot of this before. So it's, it's really wonderful to hear that, that feedback. I think it's been really good. Hopefully um, in a couple of years' time they'll all come back and say, yes, all of my doctors have told me about the importance of yeah. this. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that special magic pill. Yeah. One of the ladies said earlier, I'll have one of those pills. <laughs> um, well, it's funny you should say that. My GP said that to me. I should be more like you. I don't know how you got bowel cancer because yeah. she, she sees me walking around everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so as we said, the webinar is recorded and we will email out a copy to you. And also um, <coughs> the resources and links and things that Prue and um, Jeanette's been talking about, we'll share that with you in a document so you can just click through and, and have a look at, um, at everything. Um, so I guess that's it. Thank you all so much. Someone's saying adopt or foster a dog. That's Great idea. idea. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. That is a good Absolutely. idea. But thank you all for um, sticking with us tonight and um, keep exercising. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you.